one. Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, February 11th, 2021 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the school committee. Uh, this meeting is being held as an online Zoom meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this meeting is being audio and video recorded um, and, uh, and there will be an opportunity for public comment uh, later on in the meeting and we will um, uh, explain how that will work shortly. Let's begin first though by asking the clerk to call the role of the school committee. Member Goldman. Present. Member Voss. Present. Member Gold. Here. Uh, Mayor Narquitz. Present. Member Busansky. A tutor. A tutor? Present. You mean like a high school student? No, I Member Fallon. Member Fallon, did I see you? I guess not yet. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. And Member Kaufman. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you. And if I could just ask uh, members of the public who are joining us to please mute yourself. Um, uh, mute yourself it's just so that uh, we don't hear any background noise during the meeting. Um, we'll now move to the public comment uh, portion of the agenda. This is an opportunity for members of the public to offer comment to the school committee of up to three minutes. And I would ask those who wish to speak in public comment um, to uh, use your um, raised hand function to let me know that you wish to speak. Um, just when we all learned how to do that, the latest update of Zoom uh, changed the hand function so it's no longer, uh, well, it may be in the participant menu depending on what version of Zoom you have, but it also um, it can be found in the um, sort of the uh, emojicon uh, section as well with clapping hands and, and smiling faces and all the other things. So you may have to find it there um, depending on what version you have. So I will, um, and if you're calling in by phone, um, you'll have to use the star functions uh, to, uh, to unmute yourself um, and to let me know that you want, wish to uh, speak. I believe star six would let me know that. So let's go through the list and we will um, start with uh, uh, Jonathan Brody. Um, and Jonathan, if you could just let folks, uh, just let folks your name and where you live for the record and you have the floor for three minutes. Thank you, Jonathan Brody, William Street here in Northampton. And uh, just wanna thank all of you for your efforts throughout this really difficult experience. Uh, it's been so hard all around. Wanna also give a big thanks to all the teachers and staff um, who have been working so hard, again, through this really difficult situation and kind of give a special shout out to the special educators uh, who I've worked closely with over the years and who are doing so, so much. Uh, they, they did so much early on, doing so much now and just really appreciate their work. Um, I just wanna follow up. I had sent everyone an email uh, earlier, uh, about a week or so ago. Um, I'm definitely gonna follow up on that. Dr. Provost, really appreciate uh, you responding to me and I'll get back to you. Um, Kind of with the details of that aside, I just want to generally speak to the notion of assessment. Um, of course, it's key to addressing um, student need. Um, and uh, this is true before COVID and it will absolutely be true after. We have all heard and understood the significant concerns of, about learning regression and the short and long-term implications that has on the lives of our students. Um, and I think particularly our most vulnerable students. Um, so we in the district have had significant achievement gaps between our four elementary schools. And my concern is if we don't have robust and consistent assessment tools uh, now um, in, into the future, we stand to further deepen these great disparities um, that divide uh, in, in these 
divides fall on class, racial, ethnic, and disability lines. Again, our most vulnerable students. So um, I think for me, in addition to the health and safety of our students and staff, it's imperative that you all, as our educational leaders, the school committee, Dr. Provost, down to the principals, um, you know, really focus on developing uh, a plan to comprehensively assess students now, kind of going into the future, um, so as to address the longstanding uh, econ the educational gaps that we've had in the district, but then also to make sure that that doesn't continue uh, in the exacerbated way that it could, given everything that everyone's been facing. So um, with that, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness, your efforts around this, um, and look forward to following up with each of you. I certainly will be following up with Emily, with Ronnie, and with Susan, who represent me and my family, um, with you, uh, Mayor Narkowitz, with you, Dr. Provost, um, and also the balance of the school committee members, because um, this is so important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, I just want to verify, I see that Principal Ballancourt is here. Um, is Open House still happening right now or has it concluded? Oh no, it's not, it doesn't conclude until eight o'clock. Okay, fine. Um, so I just wanted to let folks know that um, we'll, we'll go through public comment now and I may offer another opportunity a little later in the meeting as well um, because there was this conflict with um, Open House. So um, I may, uh, ask to if anyone arrives late from open house if there's additional public comment. Um, so with that, I'll go on to the next person who has their hand up and I have a hand for uh, Catherine and Lauren Potak. So if you could unmute and um, and just let us know who you are and where you live and uh, and you have three minutes. Hi, I'm Catherine Potak. And Please. Potak. We live at 135 Deerfield Drive in Florence, and we have a second grader and preschooler in Northampton schools. And we're here tonight to ask you to begin thinking about how we can get our kids back to school as soon as possible in a full-time model. And like many other parents, we found it somewhat disheartening to watch important decision-making be delayed during the summer and what seemed to be resulting lost opportunities of the past fall. And uh, what came across is a lack of foresight and a lack of planning for, for contingencies. In the time since the school committee voted to go hybrid on October 22nd, nearly four months ago, our second grader has attended a grand total of five days of school in person, two of which We can't hear you. Your sound appears to have left us. Hmm. Um, Crucial services to which oh, you're back. We lost your sound for a moment there. All right. Uh, well, I'll I'll pick up sort of uh, where where did where did I leave off? <laughs> um, I I'm sorry. I uh, uh, Kaya, do you want to let us know? Five days. Yeah. She had mentioned five days five, at, at school. Five days. Yep. Um, it went out. All right. Um, so our second grader has attended basically uh, five days of school in person, two of which have been half days. And our preschooler, who is a special education student, was able to attend in the fall uh, two days a week for two hours a day, over the, but has not been able to really attend much uh, during the last two months, which has caused a significant backslide. He's not able to receive the crucial services he's entitled to. Um, every single day. Our, our main concern is that for nearly a year now, we've been assured that this is okay and that all kids will be behind and that they're all in the same boat. But we're compelled to push back on that sentiment because it simply isn't true. Not only are public school children in other parts of the country attending full-time in person, not only are children in other parts of the state attending full-time in person, but we have districts in our own county that are full-time in person not to mention the countless private schools that have been operating in person since September. We're watching as our children fall nearly an entire grade year behind and being told it's okay. It's not okay and it's not fair. 
what this boils down to is that here in Northampton, if you do not have the financial means to pay for a private experience, your child is falling behind in grade standards being met elsewhere, as well as falling behind in social and emotional departments. We want to ask, where is the equity here? Many parents are afraid to speak up and speak out because they don't want their children to be retaliated against, which is a fear that we do share. They may not ever make any waves, write a letter, or speak at a public comment session, but they will remove their children from the system that's the will remove their children from the system that's failing them and go with private education, school choice, or homeschooling. This is why we're asking the school committee to consider beginning the process to offer a full-time option for families who want it starting at the end of the hybrid phase and period. We may need to consider novel out-of-the-box solutions, but the time to start thinking about how to implement a full-time return is now. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for your comments. Um, the next person who has their hand raised, uh, the name is Sammy. Sammy, if you would go ahead and just identify yourself um, and uh, let us know who you are and where you live, and you have three minutes. Hi, this is actually Sahara Pensavia. I live at 552 Ryan Road. Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, what she had just mentioned. My daughter, uh, I have two children that attend Ryan Road schools and this hybrid model is not working. They need more time in school, specifically my seven-year-old who um, like Kathy's child is, has only attended five in-person days. She's falling far behind. Um, I've reached out to the principal for help, to um, the teacher for help, and the emotional backslide is the biggest concern for me, having a seven-year-old child tell you that they wish they were dead instead of attending a Zoom class is probably the worst feeling I've ever felt as a parent in my entire life, and those were her exact words because of being not able to attend the two days that she was allowed to attend because of snow and then to just be disappointed with what was going on that was what you should stop being done and fire it at them and that's not okay for a child that age to feel that way um, because they're not getting in school learning. And then I've got to tell you to hear the superintendent's message saying, hey, a bunch of people, you know, complain that the kids don't have traditional snow days. So here it is. We snapped our fingers and now you get to have a snow day where parents like me who have children who are snuggle or who are struggling do not have any actions being taken to help our children get extra help, get extra days in school. Um, there's no recourse we have, we can't help our children and they're emotionally suffering from this. And I think that anyone who considers themselves an educator or a teacher of children should be ashamed at themselves for not pushing harder for these kids that need the service, not the kids who are able to stay remote because if that's their choice, I'm not trying to take that from them, but the kids like mine who need to be in school more, who need extra help, should be getting that help and someone should be pushing for that to happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, so is there anyone else who wishes to um, speak in public comment here at seven o'clock? Um, as I said, we'll be, um, I'll check back in with the public again uh, closer to eight o'clock when uh, the open house is concluded. Um, so not seeing any other hands, let's go ahead and move on with the uh, next portion of the meeting. Um, we have item uh, recommended actions on our agenda. We have a consent agenda that includes the approval of minutes for four of our uh, meetings, um, uh, March 26, 2020, April 7th, 2020, May 14th, 2020, and December 10th, 2020. I would entertain, oops, sorry, there goes the timer. I would entertain a, um, a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Member Levy, you have your hand up. I have comments about the December minutes. Okay, so we'll remove those. Uh, we will remove the December minutes then from the consent agenda. Um, any other any other uh, questions about the minutes? 
So then the vote would be on approval of the March, April, and May uh, minutes. Um, all uh, So the vote in the affirmative would be to approve the consent agenda and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Uh, just to confirm, Mayor, sorry, I missed how you described it. The consent agenda no longer includes the 12 10 minutes. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay. Uh, yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Uh, I don't think Member Fallon has joined us yet. Yes. Yes, she has. Oh, She's Member Fallon. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. And Member Goldman. Yes. The vote is 10-0. Okay, and now we'll move to the number 10th, 2020 uh, meeting minutes. And um, let's go to, um, let's go to uh, back to Member Levy and just have uh, you uh, let us know what potential amendments you wish to make or changes or. Thanks. Um, my, my comments are about the um, 6B portion, proposal to implement modified school start 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 times. Start um, I had sent uh, Annie some language a few months ago because I felt the minutes didn't adequately reflect the reasons why I at least abstained from the vote. Um, and I think they were amended last time and then they got amended again and those comments got taken out. Um, and I, as it reads now, it, it gives the impression that I did not vote for that because um, of concerns about a possible 10 minute loss of instruction time, which is really not a fair representation of the conversation. And so I, I uh, am wondering, I've already sent Annie the language so Annie, I don't know if, if that language can get put back in. I'm happy to share with other folks the language, but my decision to, to not vote in favor was due to a lack of information from elementary school families and principals and teachers due to the way the, the survey was presented to us and to the, um, the timing of the implementation of the hybrid model and, and teachers saying that they were not they did not have an opportunity to weigh in. And I had heard from families that they did not know that this vote was happening. Uh, and so my request was that we push the vote to March uh, so that we could get input from elementary school families. Um, so, I have better uh, language that I sent to Annie, but I don't know if that, if, if that can be put back in. Do you, um, do you have that language, Annie? Or do we want to just bring this, these, this set of minutes back to a future meeting? Um, I do have that language and apologies for taking that out. There, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth on that particular section of this and a lot of different changes have been made. So I'm, I, I apologize if it, it doesn't reflect what you want now. Um, I think that uh, maybe we should bring it back and uh, I wonder if we should, I don't, I don't know exactly how to proceed with this. A lot of different people have, would like the minutes to reflect a, a different things. I'm happy to include that back in. Um, perhaps um, members of the official staff of the meeting who, who you know, presumably watched the tape and, and so I, it also needs to reflect what was said at the meeting. So, so um, if you want to go back and uh, take a look at what you've been sent and just make sure that that comports with that and then we could bring it back at a future meeting. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And I, I think Member Busansky probably has a comment on this as well. Member Busansky. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think if we run into some problems on this section, especially because it's a little, we had gotten to a much shorter format where we were giving the overview and giving the clip so that people could go and watch that section of meeting. And once we start putting in everyone side, I mean, there was a lot that was said, I think, to refute what Member Levy brought up that night in that meeting. And so, you know, you're just getting into these kind of unequal, you know, presenting sort of unequal sides of an argument. So maybe we would be better off just really kind of shortening it and then people can go watch the video, which is really, I feel like that's the formula we've been moving towards. And moving back to trying, if we put in member Levy's side, then I feel like we have to put in the other side. 
And this is just going to go on and on and get longer and longer. So why do why not just go for the kind of more for the shorter formula we seem to have come up with with the video clip? I'm I'm fine with that uh, because that way it doesn't as it currently reads it it does feel misleading. But if it simply points folks to the video, uh, I, I I'm fine with that piece. I'm happy to do that. Very happy. I want to make sure everyone's happy with that too. Okay, so that one will be uh, Mr. Gold. Yeah, um, and so I'm I'm fine with the video thing as well. I guess I would. The only thing I would ask is that there's literally nothing there. It just says for the video because as soon as any of it is in there, then it's not giving the whole picture. So if it just says refer to the video, that's fine. But if it uh, if it has any, Coming. you know, if it has anything else included in it, then I guess that's where. Um, that's where I would feel like we have to get more specifics involved in it. Okay, um, Member Busansky, your hand is still up. Are you all set or, okay, Member Fallon, you had your hand up. Sorry, I had another comment, but- oh, member sorry, Fallon, Member Busansky, then go back to you. Well, I was just gonna add that, um, I mean, I think we need to put in the motion and what passed and Absolutely. the basics of the, plan that seems to be kind of aligned with what we typically do and who voted you know and how each member voted and then the video clip so i don't think we can put nothing no it, it by law we have to uh we have to put in the motion then the second and the way that the vote came out so happy to do that okay so we'll um member felon did you have something to add to this I guess that was my question. So has open meeting law changed? Like, I know that we need to put enough information that someone who wasn't present would be able to understand what happens. And that that's more than just the motion and the vote. Like there has to be at least a little bit of information. Like, but so I guess that's my question is, has there, now that we're using videos, is that sufficient? Like, has there been some sort of guidance from the attorney general's office on if there's a video that that's allowed to replace language? Um, I don't know that there's been, I mean, again, I think that um, you need to reflect that there was a motion made and seconded and the wording of the motion and then obviously the vote on the motion. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I, I don't know, um, I've never seen that you have to provide a narrative of the debate that ensued on the motion, but I may be wrong, I don't know. Um, you could obviously that, I mean, so um, I guess we could check with our legal counsel on that. Um, clearly having, being able to embed the, embed the video is helpful because then people can actually watch the debate or watch that section of the meeting when the motion was made and seconded. So um, it just gets in, it just puts um, mem it puts our clerk in a very difficult position of trying to summarize because obviously if it's a contentious issue, then people have different interpretations. And so um, that's the, I think that's the challenge here. So. Right. I, I, I guess I just, I don't want to put Annie in a difficult position, but I also don't want to have an open meeting law violation and I'm pretty sure it has been in other cities I have I, where they've the attorney general's office has found that there wasn't enough information in the minutes for someone who wasn't present to have known what happened and so that's where I'm asking where if the video is linked does that now I guess yeah I'd ask that you I don't believe it I don't believe you could substitute a video for the written minutes. I think it's just an aid to try to fill in more detail, but I don't think it substitutes for the requirement of having written minutes. So, so we can- Written minutes have to reflect the subject of the, of the agenda item and the vote, uh, the issues of the vote, if a vote was taken. Okay, so uh, this, this item is being pulled from the agenda and will come back to us at a future meeting. Um, I do realize in uh, that I, I plowed right past item three on the agenda and forgot to ask if there were any announcements by school committee members. Um, are there any announcements from school committee? Uh, Member Fallon, you have an announcement. Yeah, I actually have two. Um, so, uh, 
Division 10 of the MASC has invited everyone um, to a presentation February 23rd from 6 till 7.30. Um, Dr. Khalees Warnham, she's the Senior Director of Educational Equity for the Brookline Public Schools. Um, she'll be presenting on understanding the connection between cultural proficiency and equity. Um, she was also the keynote speaker at the um, annual conference this year, um, and she was fantastic. The link to register should be up by tomorrow, and um, obviously it's free of charge. Um, and then in, in case you wanted to mark your calendars, um, the Attorney General's Office is inviting school committee members and municipal leaders to a virtual convening on food insecurity on Wednesday, February 24th from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, the official invitations, I think, are going out tomorrow or early next week. Um, and it looks like it'll be very interesting. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, um, you could... Um, you can register, um, I think, starting tomorrow or next week. Thank you, Member Fallon. Are there any other announcements uh, from school committee members? If you could let me know. OK, no other announcements. So um, I will continue on in the order of the agenda. Um, we did not we did not have any uh, budget transfers that made it on to the posted agenda. Um, we do have donations. Um, uh, a ten thousand donation, a ten thousand dollar donation from the Kendall Foundation for our food service program, and I would entertain a motion to approve that donation. Um, and we can hear more about it if members require that. Motion to approve the donation from the Kendall. Okay. Is there a second? second. Okay, so the second. motion is made and seconded, uh, Member Gold. And um, and uh, so is there anything you wish to add to this, Cami, about this donation? No, I just wanted to let you know that um, the article in the Gazette is what prompted it. Um, Mistel Hannah received a phone call from the Kendall Foundation, um, spoke with them for a little bit about the program that we've been running, who we're serving, um, and they offered to do what they could to help us. Wonderful. That's great. So any further debate on this um, on this gift? Okay, hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes, and I didn't get my hand up in time to just ask a question about it, but I can ask it after the roll call. Sure enough. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes, and thank you. And Member Voss. Yes. The vote is 10 to zero. Okay, so the motion is adopted. It is accepted. Member Serapy Cox, did you have a question? Yes, I was just wondering what the protocol was for thanking um, donate for donations. Um, is has there been any sort of practice of a formal um, thank you from the school committee, or is that something that the administration handles? Um, Dr. Provost. Yes, the school committee policy on acceptance of gifts includes a provision for the acknowledgement of the gifter. So that's something that the clerk and I take care of. Fabulous. And being on the uh, policy committee, I suppose I should have known that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, so um, let's now move to the uh, section five of the agenda, which is uh, reports and recommendations. Um, our first report this evening is from our two student representatives, uh, Tally Serlin and Megan O'Connor. Um, I'll turn it over to you to make your presentation. Hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know us, we're the high school representatives for the student union. My name is Tally. And I'm Megan. And we're just going to give a short presentation updating you on what's going on at the high school and with the union. So the seniors have been giving freshmen tours of the high school to welcome them. 
And this is the first time for many freshmen that they've been inside NHS as a student. So this is very exciting for them. Second semester has just started along with the new camera on policy, which was put into place to increase student engagement and make sure teachers aren't just staring at black screens all day. So far, the teachers have had a very positive reaction to the new policy and we're happy that their hard jobs are made a little bit easier. Before the institution of this policy, we took a student poll on the student union Instagram where 81% said they were against the policy and 19% was for the policy and 97 people responded. So students were wary of the policy, but now that it has been instituted, I can say from personal experience that most students have their cameras on and participation and engagement seems to be up. In other news, the sophomore class recently held a free trivia night over Zoom that got pretty high attendance from a smattering of grades and having been there myself, I can say it was really fun and got a lot of positive reactions from the people there. The sophomore class is hoping to offer more virtual community building events in the future. Finally, I'm very excited to announce that the Northamptons album was officially released on all major streaming services a, week, a few weeks ago, and they were featured in the Silver Court Bowl last Sunday. The student union has also been making a lot of exciting progress on our projects. Before we get into the bigger projects, I'd like to add that in response to the student concerns with the camera on policy, we have begun to talk to administration and teachers about having screen breaks in the middle of class, which was a large concern of students, especially because the new semester two schedule has no flex block or lunch break between classes. And that much time on Zoom can be irritating to the eyes and just generally overwhelming. So screen breaks would be an easy way to improve the learning conditions for students. Moving on to some of our more long-term projects, the Lending Library has been accepting donations for two weeks now. And so far, it looks like they've received a lot of supplies from people around the community. We've also opened grants for capstones and clubs. So we're very excited about the prospect of student organizations getting to take advantage of the additional funding that we can offer them. And the Mental Health Subcommittee has also had some interesting new developments. We had the idea to institute a peer mentoring program where freshmen will be grouped with an upperclassman buddy who can offer them advice on navigating high school in general and just be a welcoming presence to new students in the school. We have talked to the administration about the idea and they are in full support of us making this happen. We just sent out an email to the junior and senior classes asking for upperclassmen to volunteer. And so far we've received 55 volunteers, which is more than we were expecting. And we're really happy about the excited response we've gotten. It's been really fun to see our projects gain momentum and we can't wait to see how these continue to develop. Thank you all for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Are there any questions or comments from the school committee? Uh, I see some applause, but no questions. Oh, Mr. Gold, member Gold, sorry. Sorry, am I still Mr. Gold? You're still Mr. Gold. I will. I will You're your title. Um, I just want to say thank you. It's really exciting and inspiring to hear um, the creative ways y'all are, are taking on the freshmen coming in and the camera issue. That, that's, that's very, very inspiring. So well done to all of uh, everyone involved in that. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this report. Oh, actually, uh, Member Levy, you have your hand up. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the report. Really, really exciting to hear what you're doing. Um, and there's so much positive news in there. Uh, just a quick question. Are, are, is the peer mentoring program that you're starting, is that tied to other peer mentoring national programs or is it something you're designing on your own? It is not tied to any other program. It's just sort of an idea that um, the mental health subcommittee, which I'm a part of, and we just sort of came up with it on our own and have been designing it to fit this school specifically. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments from uh, members of the school committee? Uh, if not, thank you, Tally and Megan uh, for that great report. and. Um, we look forward to, to your future reports. The next item on the agenda is a report from our- Member Voss has a hand, it looks like, oh, virtually and physically. Sorry, Member Voss. Sorry, I was trying to fit in between two items while I have the floor. I'll just thank the students. That's really great work and um, wonderful ideas. Thank you. 
Um, I wanted to just say, uh, Mayor, I, I looked into the question about what needs to be in the notes and I could read you a sentence if it's appropriate and you'd like to hear it, if that would be helpful. Go for it. Okay. Um, it says, public bodies must record and maintain accurate minutes of their meetings, setting forth at a minimum the date, time, place, members present or absent and action taken at each meeting. So that's what has to be, that's what it says has to be there. Which seems, I guess the key is action taken. So that seems to comport with the listing of emotion, uh, you know, the, the spelling out of emotion and the vote taken. Um, I think that fits with that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for looking that up. Um, okay, um, so now we we'll, Member Fallon has, a, has something to add. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing the hand, so my apologies. I've got, we've got a double, double set of screens here. So Member Fallon. So I, I was just gonna say the, the case I was referring to was the uh, November 20th, 2020. So it was just this fall. It was the Sandus Field Board of Selectmen and the Attorney General's office found against them because they had insufficient minutes and the, their conclusion was, this is why I was asking, was that they said that um, the minutes, it said that they need, minutes must include a substantive summary of the discussion on each topic. And so that's where I don't think that it's really clear to me what, that they, what they do. They said that by substantial compliance, we mean that the minutes should contain enough detail and accuracy so that a member of the public who did not attend the meeting could read the minutes and have a clear understanding of what occurred. So they were found in violation because their minutes were inadequate because they weren't detailed enough. So that's the only reason I, 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 I was asking you if having the link to the video was, was now an acceptable um, alternative. I don't, I don't, I'm not aware that it is, but we can certainly do some research on that. So clearly, okay. um, clearly the attorney general's FAQ and guidebook is different than the ruling in Sandus Field. So we'll also try to get some clarification on that as well. Um, Cause the plain reading of what member Voss just read seems to, seems to say one thing. And um, so I'll send you the link. we can look into it. Okay. Um, Let's uh, let's move on and actually you should keep the floor member Fallon because the next item on the agenda is rules and policy report and uh, and there's one policy on there that requires a second reading and vote. Okay, so um, we have policy. Sorry, I'm finding it um, for a second reading and vote it is policy. DM, um, it's cross-listed as policy JJF, student activity accounts. Um, it has been updated with gender neutral pronouns. We've removed all language um, referring to assistant business managers. Um, we have removed all references um, to elementary school principals and adjusted the language to reflect um, our current practices and any changes in um, in laws that have occurred since the last time it's been um, revised. And of course, Cami gave us um, most of the input on this. She did 99% of the work on this. <laughs> um, so I would move to approve um, policy DM as presented. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion uh, made and seconded to approve uh, uh, this policy DM. Um, is there any questions or concerns about the policy? Again, this is our second reading on it and vote. Hearing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. 
Yes. And Member Gold. Yes. The vote is 10-0. Okay, so the um, policy is adopted. Um, is there any other, uh, anything else to report from Rules and Policy Member Fallon? Only that we um, have our, we have a finally scheduled another meeting. It's for March 18th and we'll be resuming work on the school committee handbook. Okay, great. Um, let's go next um, to uh, any updates from the superintendent evaluation committee and member Condon. Uh, I have no uh, substantive updates other than uh, we are also scheduling our next meeting uh, tentatively uh, at the moment for March 17th, though that's not confirmed. Uh, other than that, I have no other news. Okay, um, let's move on to budget and property and member Busansky. Thank you. Um, the budget and property subcommittee met yesterday to take a look at the first view budget presentation that um, Dr. Provost will be pre presenting at the next school committee meeting. Um, he is now going to go back and work on the next iteration and we will be meeting again on Monday, February 22nd at 4.30 p.m. It was great to have a member of the student union join us yesterday in our meeting. That was a really nice addition. It is, you know, an open meeting. And um, I just wanted, I know that Dr. Provost is gonna be addressing the budget in his remarks shortly. So I won't steal his thunder, but it was certainly um, good to see that we are in okay financial shape after some of the news stories we've seen from other districts and also, um, so uh, I'll let him say about more about that in his budget presentation. I mean, in his report tonight. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, uh, Member Busansky. Um, now let's move on to the um, report uh, from our school business administrator, um, as well as the personnel report, and turn it over to uh, Kimmy Lamica. Good evening. Um, in your packet is included the um, business report, which includes the fiscal 21 appropriation report through January 31st. Um, I still continue to work with the administrators and the staff to prepare the needed transfers while we monitor the spending for the budget appropriation, along with all the other federal grants that we have going right now for COVID. Um, Right now, compared to last year, last year's expenditures at this time of the year were at 48.7%. And right now we are running at 48.0%. So we're right on par with where we were last year at this time pre-COVID. Um, also last month, I was asked to provide a list of all the COVID related relief fund grants that we have um, at, had access to. Um, so I included that in your packet as well. Um, some of the grant deadlines have been changing, ever changing, um, since they've been issued last spring um, about the deadlines and what specific purposes we can use them for. They've refined those things along as they've gone uh, regulation wise. Um, so that's information for you as well if you have any questions. Um, and also I have one gift to report, the Bridge Street School PTO gift of $3,843.50 was provided to the principal there for headsets, microphones, and noise buffers. And the warrants are included in your packet that your representative has signed during the month of January to date. Personnel report, I have, yeah, where's my sheet? I, we've had 10 new hires and six separations during January. Okay, thank you very much, Cami. Are there any questions for our business administrator about those reports? Okay, seeing none, we'll now move on to uh, our superintendent report and turn to Dr. Provost. Thank you. Let me just say that I was moved by the comments I heard at the beginning of the meeting today. Um, and I want those who are feeling frustrated and, and struggling because there isn't more in-person learning time to know that they're heard. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to note that we've made so much progress since our last regular meeting. 
At that time, you'll recall in-person instruction had been suspended due to the post-holiday COVID-19 surge. We were completely remote for all grade levels and all populations. And as of today, 74% of the students who are enrolled in the hybrid model are receiving in-person instruction. And we were exactly one school day away from completing the transition to hybrid learning for students who want to receive in-person instruction. In the elementary grades, twice as many students have opted for the hybrid model as have chosen to remain remote. In the middle school, there is an even split between hybrid and remote. And at the high school, twice as many students are opting to remain remote rather than join the hybrid model. Students in both the hybrid and remote models closely match the racial makeup of their schools and the district as a whole. And at this time, I'm very happy to report that contact tracing has still not shown any evidence of within school virus transmission. We've also made a lot of progress with our budget planning. Since our last meeting, the governor has filed his FY22 budget proposal and the annual joint city council school committee meeting to review the fiscal condition of the city has been held. These events mark the official beginning of our budget development period. Let me say, from the outset that our district is in good financial standing. And I wanna thank you for that, Cami, and thank the mayor for that, and thank everyone who has contributed to that through the years. I know the reports of financial troubles in other districts provoke anxiety in our own school community. And I can say at this time, I do not anticipate any significant disruptions to our services or our programming. I've had three budget workshops with the ALT team so far. We have another day long session scheduled for tomorrow. I met with the budget and property subcommittee to review an initial draft of the first view budget I'll pre be presenting in two weeks. And we'll meet again with the subcommittee next week to continue working on the draft. Let me say again, we're not grappling with large financial problems. The discussion at this point centers on how we can best allocate resources to support our students' academic recovery after the prolonged educational disruptions caused by COVID-19. As I mentioned in my last report, midwinter screenings are underway. This also harkens back to um, one of the commenters tonight. We've begun analyzing data from the second round of screening to identify students needing extra support at this time and to estimate the scope of the academic recovery challenges we will face next year so that we can direct budgetary resources to schools and students showing the greatest needs. We've also launched the Education Trust Survey that is a part of my approved evaluation goals for this year. As you'll recall, one of the recommendations from the district review was to gather feedback concerning barriers students experience preventing full participation in all air learning opportunities offered by the district. We were encouraged to launch a process that, quote, attracting a broad base of students should be structured to enlist their views on their educational experience in the district. Particular attention should be given to the culture of the school environment, diversity, inclusion, curriculum, instruction, assessment, and support services. The Education Trust, which is a national nonprofit that works close that works to close opportunity gaps that disproportionately affect students of color and students from low-income families um, will be our partner in this. Through their research and advocacy, EdTrust supports and efforts that expand, ex expand rather excellence and equity in education from preschool through college, increase college access and completion, particularly for historically underserved students. They engage diverse communities dedicated to education equity and increased political and public will to act on equity issues. They've designed a multi-level survey strategy for us in order to address that district review finding. Student voice will be prioritized in the process with students in grades seven through 12 taking their vision of the version of the survey on February 24th. There are also surveys for teachers and administrators. These were launched last week and there will be surveys for families which will open the week after vacation. So please be on a lookout, on the lookout for a video starring me and our family and student engagement coordinator, which is part of the communication campaign to encourage broad participation in the survey. The search for Cami's successor is also well underway. 
a large and diverse screening committee representing many organizational units that interface directly with the school business administrator met to review materials submitted by 23 applicants for the position. As a safeguard against implicit bias, the materials reviewed by the committee in a masked or de-identified format. So we were um, dealing with people who are known as numbers rather than their names or other identifiers. Um, the results were very clear. There were four candidates who stood out from all the rest based on the paper screening. We'll be interviewing all four next Wednesday to determine which ones to move forward to you as finalists. Given the timeline of Cami's retirement, my plan would be to keep the March 11th agenda as light as possible. So the main purpose of that meeting would be for you to interview the finalists we send forward and vote to enter into negotiations with one of them. And that brings me to my final point for tonight. This is not news for the committee, but it may be news for some within our community. We're not only losing Cami in central office, but Nancy Cheevers has informed me of her intention to retire in July. I'm the appointing authority for the position, so the search won't be front and center on your agenda in the way the business manager searches, but it will be in the forefront of my work. Nancy, We'll have 29 years of service to the district, including eight years as the director of curriculum and assessment. And I was thinking earlier today that the last in-person, non-socially distanced meeting this group held was for the unveiling of the complete district curriculum, which in my opinion is the crowning achievement of Nancy's career. That was a celebratory night, do you remember? You remember the applause, the excitement, the pride? It was the last normal thing this group did. And I'm so glad we were able to have that moment in person instead of through this sad substitute for human interaction that has been our only way of um, communicating for almost a year now. And so I wish Nancy the best for her retirement and we certainly will miss her. Um, we'll certainly feel uh, the one-two punch of losing both Cami and Nancy within a month of each other. It'll be a tough time in central office, um, but certainly they've both given so much to this district and richly deserve a rewarding retirement. That's my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Provost. We appreciate that. Um, let's now um, move into the um, well, we have no old business. Uh, so, and in terms of new business, we have several votes um, this evening. Uh, the first would be on the NHS program of studies. This is an annual um, uh, presentation and vote that we take. And I will turn the floor over to NHS principal, uh, Lori Valancourt to uh, present the program of studies. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just love presenting the program of studies. I think it shows just how much growth that we have and, and it really um, is a great opportunity to take a look at the changes and um, some of our, our current values, our changing values and what we see as important in offering our Northampton High School students. So I hope you find as much appreciation in this as I do in presenting it. Um, so typically what happens is I go through the program of studies and I go through each section and then point out um, the changes in anything that is new and um, significant to point out. But I will stop at the end of each section and take questions if you have them. I believe you have all seen this and it was sent to you earlier by um, Annie. So everything pretty much remains the same until we get to our early graduation page section on page 12. So I'm going to start there, but I will pause before I do that and ask based on all of the information up to page 12, if anybody wants to comment on that. Okay. So, um, page 12, you will see there's a new section in here that's titled um, Early Graduation. 
And Northampton High School has always um, offered early graduation. However, it has never really been formalized. So we've usually done an early graduation based on student, um, students case by case basis. Like we have a kid who's going to go and has enlisted in the military and needs to start boot camp early. And so they have enough credit. So we allow an early graduation. Sometimes we have students who wanna start college earlier um, and in order to receive some of the grant money they're entitled to, they need to graduate early and close out their credits and their enrollment in the high school. And so we've always kind of done this, but it has never really been formalized. And we thought, um, well, I do want to say that, you know, we do have a new associate principal this year, and that's my colleague, Megan Harrison. And she comes to us with this wealth of knowledge about early graduation and dual enrollment and um, work-based learning. And so she's like, you have to really make this something a little bit more formal. So she kind of encouraged us, which is why we have now put it in the program of studies. So what you will see here is that we are now allowing students who have to graduate one semester early if they've completed all of the 28 credits that are required of them to graduate from Northampton High School. So they will be able to graduate following the first semester of their senior year. So that is a new addition. The next, so everything remains the same um, on the levels of instruction. And then when we get to the next section, which is on page 15, this is another adjustment. And um, I'm going to explain the, the adjustment to the dual enrollment opportunities. Um, I wanna back up a little bit and say that all of these changes that we have in this program of studies this year really focus on um, our offerings and making them equitable and accessible to all students. So that's really our mission this year. It's in our current SIP. And we wanna make sure as we're going into next school year that we are making our program of studies something that is accessible for all students and offers just a new, um, some new opportunities for all students to achieve in different kinds of ways. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the dual enrollment changes but prior to that, if it's okay, I'd like Megan to kind of give the rationale for these changes because this really is um, her creation and I feel like she should have some opportunity to be able to voice that over. Is that okay if Megan does that piece? Sounds fine to me. Okay, go ahead, Meg. All right, thank you. So um, what we wanted to do was increase enrollment and advanced coursework as well as work-based learning opportunities for our hard, high needs populations. So one of the things we thought about was that if students take one free dual enrollment class per semester, junior and senior year, they'll graduate with 12 free college credits. And at a state school like UMass, that saves $5,000 just in tuition, never mind fees, materials, and other costs. Um, dual enrollment classes are also linked to higher graduation rates and increase the likelihood that students will enroll in college. Studies show that students who complete dual enrollment programs in high school tend to have higher cumulative GPAs during their first three years in college. And these benefits hold true for both the high achieving students and students from other subsets. Advantages were also seen in the population of male and low income students, two subsets that often struggle academically in high school and beyond. And expanding dual enrollment opportunities is beneficial to students across the board, particularly those that do not typically see themselves as college bound. So what we're trying to do is like open this up to the largest amount of students possible to have access to early college and dual enrollment. So here are the specific changes. So right now students or next year students will be able to earn two additional credits um, a year in combination with dual enrollment classes. So each year students typically earn eight credits a year. So they earn four semester one and four semester two. With this new um, opportunity, what we're saying is that students can take a dual enrollment class if they would like in the summer, or they can take an additional dual enrollment class during the school year. Um, on campus. So they can, they can, at the end of each year, they can have um, in their 11th and 12th grade year, they can have an additional two credits for, towards um, dual enrollment. And another change is that we have made some, um, some post-secondary partnerships with HCC, GCC, which has been a partner for a while, and newly Westfield State. And so um, with the help of Megan, we have been able to 
um, work with them to give us some pretty awesome deals on providing dual enrollment on our campus and um, during the school day or after the school day on our campus in really kind of high interest areas. So we have a menu of offerings such as introduction to business, criminal justice, um, intro to Latinx studies, um, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. I, the, I mean, the list goes on and on, but these are all mass core classes that will be transferable to um, a state college. So that's another change to do this dual enrollment opportunity. And finally, um, another change is that dual enrollment will be accepted as credits for graduation at Northampton High School. So for example, right now, if a student was to take dual enrollment classes, um, they would only be able to count towards graduation credits at Northampton if they were fully dual enrolled. So if they went and they took English for just one class that wouldn't count as their English requirement. But if they were to take four dual enrollment classes, then it would count. So what we're saying for next year is that this would be um, any dual enrollment class could count towards their required courses. So, so those are some of the big um, changes with our dual enrollment courses and our offerings for next year. We are still very proud of having our relationship with Smith College. Um, unfortunately, Smith College, you know, it is limiting to all of our students. It requires a 3.4 uh, grade point average. Not all students are able to um, enroll or participate. And so working with these partner schools really gives us this great opportunity for them to experience college. So that's the dual enrollment piece. Ronnie, I'm sorry, member gold. Oh, that, that's both, <laughs> both work. Um, i just curious, do you like how, for us to think, you know, and, and potentially like for future implications, like do you see this being, um, what's the word, uh, maintainable for multiple years? Like, is this something that, you know, you're gonna have to adjust it. Yeah, what is the, what are the long-term implications there? Sure. So we've been offering dual enrollment, um, you know, for many years now. And we have, so for example, every year we have offered a health careers class and we can enroll maybe, you know, this year we have 12 students enrolled. Last year we had just about 30 students enrolled. So we have some of that budgeted. Um, I do see this as something you know, and so right now with the work that Megan has done, she's able to, you know, base, she's able to work some little bit of magic, like we can buy one class, get two free from HCC and um, Westfield, she's working on a buy one, get one from Westfield State. And so some of this has really been helpful in us being able to maintain it. It all will depend on some budget, but um, we're hoping that some of that will be passed and granted for our students. Um, I, I didn't, what I didn't say, which you reminded me of in regards to the sustainability is that this really needs to be something that requires some targeted recruitment. Um, our goal really is to make sure that we are uh, supporting students who haven't had the opportunity to take these uh, college courses. And so we really wanna target some of these students specifically our English language learners and um, some of the other groups in our school who just have not yet experienced an opportunity such as this. Member Voss. Thanks. Um, I see Dr. Provost has his hand up. So if he wants to go Dr. ahead and do that, that's fine. You're muted, Dr. Provost. Thank you. I, I just wanted to speak to the uh, sustainability question. So thank you for letting me go first. Well, it's on the table. Um, we. And thank you for queuing that up because I know that that both you and Member Gold know from the discussion at the subcommittee meeting yesterday, one of the things that we're looking to do is use some stimulus funds. We'll be asking the school committee to approve some use of stimulus funds to sort of launch this program. We think we have about two years of funding through that. And that'll give us a chance to, to see how successful we can become at meeting our goal of uh, providing more access to higher level courses for a broader range of students and if if that is in fact 
something we're able to do, I think you'll see that the economics of this are, are actually quite favorable. Um, I can explain that a little bit more when I give the um, first few budget to see what it might look like after two years or after three years, if this continues to be, or if this turns out to be successful. Um, but I, I, I think you'll, you'll, you'll find that it's a, a really attractive um, way of increasing access to really important learning opportunities for kids. Um, I don't think it'll always be a buy one, get one free world in higher ed, but right now the prices are good. So it's another reason why this is the time to move, in my opinion. Okay, member boss. Thanks. Um, first of all, this is fantastic. And I just want to thank you both for all your work on it. I, I am convinced that giving as many students as possible chances either in the dual enrollment or at Smith is really helpful to them in moving on. And one thing that came up at our committee meeting yesterday was that um, these dual enrollment opportunities um, would be happening either at the high school or virtual. So there wouldn't be an issue with students having to travel. So um, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that because that's great. It, it means it's much easier for students to take advantage of it. Um, and sorry, I, I made some notes and I'm seeing what, um, two other, just one comment and one question. Um, I think one of the differences between the dual enrollment and Smith, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but just to clarify this is dual enrollment, you can actually get college credit. Whereas the Smith um, courses are part of your high school transcript and you could certainly skip a college class, but you're probably not gonna get actual college credit. And maybe I'll let Lori answer that. And then I have another question too. I just wanted to differentiate those. Sure, so that is true. With dual enrollment, you receive credit on your college, on your transcript, your high school transcript, and you receive college credit. And the Smith College courses are more of um, enrichment experiences and they do go on our transcript, but they do not count as college credit. Right. However, and you I just send the transcript to a college as part of your, your um, enrollment package. Yeah, and, and that's fine. I just wanted to clarify that for folks out there. But the other question I have, um, and this might be a longer conversation somewhere else, I don't wanna pigeonhole us now, but um, I wonder why, um, it appears that for dual enrollment opportunities, there is not the constraint of students, get the wording right here, must exhaust the NHS um, options. Whereas to go to Smith, they have to exhaust somebody's interpretation of what's, um, you know, the overlap between say a Smith class and an NHS class. And, and I just, I put that out there because I, I really hope there can be more conversation about that. And we could get to a point where things are a little more flexible in terms of students being able to go to Smith to take classes because I think more students could take advantage of it. Um, I'm curious how much you think the GPA is limiting them versus some of these other things. I certainly, um, feel like it's both of those, but I, I would like to see us moving to being able to encourage students to walk down the street in our own city and take these classes at Smith. I think they just get so much out of that. I agree with you. Um, there's nothing that you said that I don't agree with. However, we do have a, 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 a in our agreement with Smith College, it does state that the courses need to be enrichment courses and courses that are, um, beyond the offerings of Northampton High School. So this was in our original contract with Smith and it's something that can be um, looked at again or it's something that can be reconsidered but it really would have to be done with in partnership. And again, it was a part of the original agreement because we wanted, or Smith College was making this um, an opportunity for students to experience courses other than those taught at Northampton High School. No, thanks. I just, I, I guess the big thing is to just try to give as many students as possible a chance to do it. Thanks. hundred percent. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Member Fallon, you have your hand up next. Thanks. Um, thanks, Principal Valcourt. I think this is so great that we're offering so many opportunities to our students. I guess my question is, is how does this affect your long-term planning? Like what, if you're talking, if you're looking at staffing and each year you're not sure who's even going to be in the building, like who's planning on early graduation, who's going to be there for dual enrollment, and you aren't even sure um, how many teachers you'll need to be teaching. Um, 
I guess I'm wondering what your plan is as far as um, maintaining staffing levels and if you have a vision like for you want to expand in other areas um, or if you find that um, you know that you don't have a need to offer this because you know you've got a big group of students that are going to be off campus that that that's the time that you are able to offer a class that you weren't able to offer at a different time so I guess I'm kind of asking what your big picture is. Sure, I'm going to invite Megan to um, respond to this a little and then I'll fill in some gaps. Um, thanks, so um, we still get the same, we'll still have the same per people allocation from the state regardless of if students are taking dual enrollment classes. So that's gonna allow us to expand our elective options and have smaller class sizes at the high school. So that's what we're excited about for that. And go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, that's great. I was going to, um, and I was going to ask part two after you're done with that is, um, do you expect to maintain them the same level of AP offerings? I know that the AP exams have been optional now, and I didn't know if that was still a pilot or now that you're offering so much more in the dual enrollment, if that was maybe going to supplant that or if you were planning on maintaining all of those offerings as well. So we are going to maintain the AP offerings. In fact, as I continue, you'll see that there are a couple of more you know, offerings for AP next year so that we're not making any changes there. What I hope is that some of those AP classes can be a little bit smaller, which will mean that um, we might get a new group of students who are interested or might wanna try one because they're not running at 30. And, um, you know, we have tried different recruiting strategies for all of our students to be able to take AP classes and we're not super successful. So maybe after some time, we can kind of change that trajectory. But right now we're hoping that we can have some high interest classes off campus that might interest a different subset of students who aren't engaging in the AP classes. But we have no plans to change or decrease the number of AP offerings. And right now the test is still optional. Okay, are there any more questions or comments about the program of study? Oh, I am not done. I uh, know you're not. I just, before we move on to the next section, I just want to make sure that, uh, that, that any questions about that change continue. All right, because it's just, it's getting even better. So the next section you will see is on and this was just added, so it's on page 16. And in this section, you will see that we have added at Northampton High School, a seal of biliteracy. And again, this goes with all of our values and all of our, um, our hopes to make sure that learning is both accessible and equitable for students. So this is a really great addition. Um, we, Northampton High School will be offering graduates a seal of biliteracy. And it's another, um, it, what this is, is it's a seal that goes on a student's transcript and on their diploma. And it recognizes high school graduates who attain proficiency in two or more languages by the time they graduate high school. So um, what happens is if we have a student who is an English learner and they are completely fluent in Spanish, if they test, if they have a certain score on their access test, or if they score proficiency in um, MAT, MCAS English, they are able to receive this seal of biliteracy. And this can go to employers, or it can go on their college transcripts as another way to say, look, the student is multilingual, and um, here is our acknowledgement of this. It can also work for students who um, may have taken the AP world language test in a variety of different languages, including um, like say they take the Spanish world language test, they can, and they score a three or four, they can also achieve the seal of biliteracy on their college transcript or on their high school transcript and on their diploma. So this is another opportunity just to really showcase students who are multilingual and to um, really help with another opportunity for recognition. Any question about the seal of biliteracy? Okay. Wait, I have a question, but I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. 
Are you gonna are you going to be allowing the portfolio based um, grading for the world languages? Um, so the portfolio is that for the world? Uh, look, hold on a second. State approved language proficiency exam or portfolio language exam is not available. Yes, we would allow that the portfolio if it's not available. However, students, um, we do this now where we can purchase the test for any student who wants to take it, even if we're not offering that AP class, we are typically able to get the, the language exams or any AP exam, even if we don't offer it at the high school. But um, we can look into the portfolio language exam. I, I'm not super familiar with it, but I wouldn't think that that'd be something that would inhibit this from working. Megan, do you have more information on the portfolio piece? I don't, but I definitely will look into it. And I, I agree with you. I don't think that that would inhibit any of our students from being able to do that. There's also um, a test we can purchase and Lauren Berry, who is the ELL coordinator for the district is working on this um, so that we could test students in any heritage language that they might have that's not limited just to the languages that we offer at the high school. That's awesome. Member Seraphine Cox, you have your hand up next. I just wanted to uh, voice my uh, excitement about the biliteracy um, um, certification, I think you called it. Um, uh, and I, I'm very interested in expanding the language access throughout the district. Uh, and I know that the younger grades are not your purview, uh, <laughs> Principal Valencourt, but um, I think, uh, just saying that, uh, of course, the earlier we start with languages, the more uh, biliterate and bilingual uh, students will be by the time they get to uh, senior year of high school. So um, um, just wanting to plant again, plant that seed for, uh, uh, for the superintendent and introduce perhaps the idea for uh, the rest of the, of the committee. I've, I've uh, talked with uh, Superintendent Provost about this idea and how to integrate um, um, uh, either language immersion or, or you know, uh, just integrate more languages at younger age to support that idea throughout uh, all of the grades in the district. So glad to see you moving in that uh, direction, Principal Alcorn. I think the beauty of having it, thank you. And I think the beauty of having it in the program of studies is that when it is introduced to our eighth graders, um, they can recognize that this language opportunity is available to them and continuing with their language and their exploration of language through high school is really important. But I agree that starting earlier um, is just incredibly important and being able to use this as kind of a launch for the importance of, of being multilingual is a good op good start. So thank you, I agree. Okay, um, continue. All right, so surprisingly, there aren't any more real significant changes. Um, we move into Innovation Pathways program and this is still happening. There is nothing new in this section. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I think I had that in the wrong order. So now we move into the English department. There's nothing new in this section. I'm on page 23. This all remains the same. You'll see on page 23 that we do offer courses, some that, that um, go every other year. And next year we will be launching the Great Short Stories, which is a new class. And that will run at the same time as literature on the screen. Um, but we, so that happens every other year. So this will be the first time that the Great Short Stories is going to run. And then we are in the social studies section when this starts on page 26. And then if you move to page 28, you will notice this is where we have our new, um, we have an additional advanced placement class and that is in world language. So world language is now a requirement for graduation. And um, we have never, we have an off, right now we offer a world language class, but we haven't offered an honors world language class. And what the department decided is that it might, it, it might be a better opportunity to offer an advanced placement world history class, um, focusing on modern world history instead of um, 
instead of having, um, sorry, I just got distracted, instead of having an honors class. So this is a brand new course, the AP World History. Can, can I interrupt? Sorry. Yes. I think you might've said world language. I'm if sorry. I heard it right. And just I think that's what to... I got distracted on because yeah. Megan sent me a text that said world history. And I'm like, what do you mean? So yeah, I'm sorry. It definitely did. World history is where we are and what I'm referring to. That's a new class. Okay, let's see. So everything else in history remains the same. Everything else in our great science department remains the same. There are, oh, we do have some additions. Well, we have some changes in the mathematics department. So as you know, this year we ran some year long integrated math classes, 1A and 1B, and the majority of our students took this as a year long class. And um, within that class, what we did is we offered, um, we offered embedded honors, an opportunity for embedded honors. We have never offered honors classes in integrated math one until this year. And the feedback that we had from students and caregivers was that um, having this opportunity to have an embedded honors in the IM1 was really helpful and something that was really appreciated. So the mathematics department took that feedback and what they decided is that they were going to um, offer embedded honors courses in all of the integrated math classes. So we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to having the heterogeneous groupings and um, within each of the integrated math classes. So that is a change specifically to the IM1, but also to the IM2 and three, having the embedded honors option. Any questions about that? Member Levy. I, I am assuming from the context that embedded means that there are honor students and non-honor students in the same classroom. Can you say more about how that works? Sure, I can. So um, you're right, that's exactly what it is. So when a student enrolls in the integrated math class, they will have an opportunity to decide either as they enroll or a few weeks into the class that they want to be on the honors track or they want to just be on the, um, the traditional college bound track, which is the general integrated math curriculum. So um, they can choose at any point or within a few weeks of the class to take the honors or just stay on the same general level class. And so what this requires is that students, um, that teachers need to differentiate within the mathematics curriculum, but it also means that students um, have an opportunity to be in classes um, where they have mentors and they have higher achieving students and they have the ability to, to have goals set for them that are a little higher with higher expectations and just to really be able to engage in math, um, you know, all through, for, throughout many different levels of the curriculum. Uh, we will still offer the integrated in mathematics year long 1A and 1B for students who do not want to participate in um, just the semester long class. And so that class would just be for the for a general level and not an honors class. Can you say more about what the how the outcomes compare the students who are in the embedded class but did not participate in the honors versus students who are not in the embedded class? Do, have you seen any increase in their abilities or the outcomes? Similarly, have you? what are the outcomes of the students who are in the embedded honors versus students who would just be in a full-fledged regular honors, not embedded program? Sure. So this is the first, it, it's hard for me to answer because we don't have a ton of data yet, but because this was the first year that we were able to do that. This is the first semester that we are, you know, the first year that we've offered the embedded honors. And so it's hard for me to say what the outcomes are, but I don't, and I'm not certain exactly what outcomes you're looking for, like um, overall grade point averages or 
I'm not, you know, failure rates, I'm not certain. Yeah, well, I guess if it's the first time, then what I would be looking for in the future would be their abilities in, in future courses. So it would just be, I would love for you to pay attention to that and be able to come back to us with that. Because I'm really, I'm, I'd be really curious about that. I, I appreciate the idea of scaffolded courses with multiple abilities in the same class. Just really curious about the outcomes there. The yeah. other piece is um, that I'm wondering about is, whether you're seeing any changes in the demographics of the students who are opting to enroll in the honors, um, the embedded honors, are you seeing any difference there versus students who would have uh, the, the demographics of your previous honors level courses? Right, and so I think that is some of the magic of doing this embedded coursework is that what we do know from past data is that our students who are enrolling in honors classes are um, not kids from our, um, you know, are not the students we're hoping to target. So the economically disadvantaged or kids of the global majority, those are not the kids who have been taking our honors mathematics classes. And so we're hoping, um, you know, by being able to be heterogeneously grouped like this, they can see that they can rise to this occasion of being able to participate in accelerated mathematics. Really, we're not going to be able to see this, um, any change in data until we um, participate and get in mathematics, MCAS, when we do the math MCAS, we'll see if the scores increase for all learners. And then we'll be able to look to see which level they participated in. That will provide us with some good data. But right now, like I said, it's, it's a little bit early to be able to tell, but I can say that typically it is our, um, we, you know, we have not been super successful with being able to offer on, or for kids to all kids, all learners to access the honors level mathematics classes. The tracking has been pretty significant. Yeah. So I appreciate what you're saying about really being interested in the data once we can see the achievement. And I'll be really curious to hear that as well. But it sounds like so far, looking at the, the students who have opted to do the honors level embedded piece, it does it, what you're saying is there's no shift yet in the demographics of students who are opting to do that? I'll have to study it towards the end of the year and look at transcripts and see how their grades are and, and who's enrolled in the classes. I'll have to do a deeper dive, but I can do that for you. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll be curious in the grades too, but mostly just even right now without knowing their grades, simply knowing the demographics of who's who's in those, those who's opted for it would be interesting as well. Me too. Thank you. Member Busansky. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Principal Valancourt. This is a lot of exciting stuff you've been presenting tonight. Um, <laughs> however, I, you know, I'm really concerned about this um, permanent change in the math curriculum. My understanding, this was gonna be sort of a one year pandemic change. Um, I've heard differently from parents and students in the honors embedded track. And I've heard that they really haven't been able to get the honors level math that they've been looking for and they haven't been challenged appropriately. And I've had some pretty upset parents and students talk to me. So to me, I'm hearing something completely differently than you. So to, to make such a major change and move for, I mean, is it a permanent change? Is it one more year? I don't really quite understand where at where we're at. Let's start there. So where we're at is that we are going to run, it is a permanent change. And we will continue to collect data and look at our data to show um, how students, which students are engaging and how successful they are based on some of the standardized tests that we have to offer. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is a permanent change at this time. So I just want to point out that we do track in math. I mean, when you look, and I think you know this more than anyone, but we, first of all, we have um, topics in mathematics. We have integrated math spread out over two semesters. And then, so what we're really just saying is that we're gonna um, reach a broader range in this kind of upper echelon of math, but not across the whole board. We're saying that some kids really need to be challenged appropriately, whereas other kids can be mentors to kids who aren't doing as well. It just doesn't all match up to me. It's great maybe at the integrated math one level that you can offer an honors course, I mean, an honors track, because we've never had that before, as we all know, right? Integrated Math One hasn't had an honors track, but 
what I'm, but this seems like a major ch permanent change to make based on very little data, one semester during a pandemic. And um, I, I just really find it concerning. It also, what you're saying about the higher level math doesn't match up with something that um, Dr. Provost presented yesterday in our budget and property meeting about how we have been successful at getting a much wider range, especially higher needs kids, um, socioeconomic diversity, et cetera, into our AP classes. So I'm just not sure where the mismatch between what you presented and what he presented yesterday, but um, you know, uh, so I, I don't know, I don't have any data to back up anything. I'm just telling you what I'm hearing from parents and students and um, the information I know, but it, to me, it's a really concerning change that, um, and I know we're not even here to vote on, that's, this isn't really considered part of our vote. So I just want to put it out there that I, um, yeah, and, and leave it with you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'd love to respond to that. So first of all, there, we do offer a math foundations class, you're right. We do offer the integrated IM or the integrated math 1A and 1B. And then the only classes that would have the integrate or the embedded honors would be IM one, two, and three. And then the other courses, the advanced math courses can happen. Um, you know, those are, those are when students choose their pathway or their track for mathematics, they can choose to be in the honors pre-calc, the AP calc AB and so forth, or to participate in a dual enrollment class or um, you know, any other mathematics opportunities. So I'm, you know, and just like all the things that happen in this program of studies, which is really the nice part of it, is that we see how it works for a year, we collect the data, we gather evidence, and then we make decisions based on that about what we think is best for students and um, all students. And so when we talk about things being permanent, I mean, nothing is ever, you know, written in stone forever, but you know, I think trying it for another year and seeing and really being able to get some evidence to see how it is supporting students is an opportunity that I think that we should explore and take advantage of. And I would hope that if there are families or students who are not feeling particularly challenged or are not feeling um, as if they are, they are excelling in mathematics because they are in classes with students who are not on an honors track, that they would speak with me or to Ms. Harrison or to the teacher, and we would make sure that um, all the opportunity that they deserve is being available to them. So I just want to add that, you know, um, I am one, I am two, I am three, that's freshman, sophomore, junior year. That's it. Like that's the majority of their high school experience, unless they decide to take two maths per year, which they weren't allowed to do this year. Mm -hmm. um, that is it, the majority of their high school experience. It's not like this is just one class and then they get to go on to the honors courses you're talking about. You're really talking about the majority of their high school experience being structured this way. It's not a short thing, it's, it's, it's long oh. <laughs> in their high school career. I just want to understand for so you're saying that the majority of their high school experience they would have to be in math with mixed with students of um, different levels. They'd have to be in a math. It's not about being in students with mixed levels, but they would have to be in a math class where they're not able to be fully challenged. Okay, yeah, I'd be interested in knowing um, what the lack of challenge is. I think that'd be interesting to explore and hear more about. Sure. Okay, uh, Member Voss. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to echo what Member Busansky just said. I'm really concerned about what I'm hearing. Um, to add to it, this is essentially a conversation that happened at the middle school five to 10 years ago in that range. And um, there was a lot of these same concerns expressed. And I guess to start where we all are on the same page, the goal is a good one and one we should keep in mind, which is to encourage all students to excel at math and get and have confidence in math. And I think that's where everyone's coming from. And I think we all share that. Um, and you're recognizing there's certain students that are not being brought along on that ride. And the goal is to show them through examples of other students that everybody can do math. So I understand that, but I don't think this is a smart approach. I don't think it worked at the middle school. 
if it had worked at the middle school, we wouldn't be seeing this problem in the early years of the high school because there'd be more of a, a range of students um, participating in the higher level math. And to put at the level of um, integrated math two and three, um, this uh, choose honors and be in the same classroom, I think is a real um, uh, disadvantage to those kids who are quick at math and have um, and are ready for more. And while I appreciate them serving as examples, I don't think it's fair to them to ask them to do that for what really is the majority of their high school. And some more history here is when integrated math one, two, and three became the math sequence at the high school, there was the intention, I believe from some of the teachers, but I correct me if I'm wrong, um, to not offer honors in any of those. And there was a lot of community conversation where we um, moved to having honors in integrated math two and three, but it, it took a lot of people speaking up and sharing some of the concerns I'm saying right now. Um, I think any of these students who wanna go on in math need a more rigorous math experience than serving as role models for part of the reason that they're in that class. Um, we can get more advanced math students to TA and to help and to be mentors, but by the time you're at that level of math and you wanna move on into some of these fields, it to me, in an analogy would be putting kids at different levels of a foreign language together in the same classroom. It, it's asking them to give up a lot. And I, I really hope you reconsider this. I, I'm very concerned about it. And, and I'll just end by saying, I know the, the intention is good. I, I really appreciate it. I think we can do a lot better introducing all of our students to how exciting STEM and math in particular here can be and supporting them so that when they arrive at the high school, they're ready to do more in math. Um, and we, we need to do better at that. I'm not saying we're doing a great job at this, but I don't think this is the way to do it. Dr. Provost, did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify something that was said regarding information that was shared at the Budget and Property Subcommittee yesterday. And um, for, for those of you who weren't there, I was, uh, really praising our AP program for uh, being able to enroll students that were representative of the entire student body at the high school. But that was all AP classes. That was all courses combined that wasn't specific to math. Um, so I, I do believe that Principal Valancourt is right that we still see differences within math, um, but we have other courses that are doing a much better job of recruiting from across the board. So that I just wanted to, to explain that difference that's in um you know that 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 difference and that that confusion you were expressing about well how come you're saying this principal bound court when we just saw those charts that john showed with us yesterday it was because i was combining all ap classes in that in that chart um and then the other thing that i think i just want to say is to go back to my report we are still one day away from getting into hybrid learning for the high school. So, you know, no student other than our most vulnerable kids have even been in, in classes in the high school yet. I think that um, whatever information we get this year is going to be extremely unreliable because the learning experience has been so different. I think really we'll know more about how, how successful this is when we have an opportunity to have kids in the classroom every day, which is really what this was designed for. You know, this model that the high school is presenting is certainly not unique or um, unusual, but it is meant for kids who are in a typical setting where they're going to school every day. It's not meant for online. It's not meant for hybrid. Um, a lot of things that um, may work in a typical setting are very challenging to do in the hybrid or remote world. So I just wanted to put that out there. I think we have to keep that in mind, especially when we're evaluating um, what's happening right now. I, you know, I personally have been a recipient of a lot of online classes, and I've found lots of times it's hard for me to maintain the challenge 
because not because the teacher's bad, not because the classroom setup is bad, but just because it's so hard to, to learn like this for me anyways. I mean, some kids excel at it. And I just think that's a, another variable we have to keep take into account. That's all I'm saying. Um, Member Kaufman. Yeah, I, um, thank you for all of this, um, Mr. Valancourt. I was just wondering what this, this controversy, if you will, or how to approach math has been happening since the 60s. So, um, and, and there's always two sides and I don't know which is right and some kids benefit and some kids don't and it's just very controversial. I know, I guess what, for me, what's important is to hear what your math teachers have to say. Is, is there an openness to this? Is there resistance? Is it split? Is there a way that you could summarize your level of engagement with your staff and um, their level of interest in moving in this direction? I can. So this is all driven by the math department and their current experience with having the embedded honors in the IM classes. And so they're really excited about this opportunity to have heterogeneous grouping and the embedded honors in the I all of the IM classes. So this comes from them. I think that it, it sounds like it would be important enough to have some additional conversation with the math department as they are the professionals and have most of the experience. And so, you know, that would be really important for me to invite Rachel Stabley Hale to the table and have her answer more questions. She really holds the knowledge of this. And of course, like I said um, prior, you know, it, we're, we're yet to collect some data and really look at some of the the specifics. So yeah. um, there's a lot to consider. Thank you. Okay. Member Boss. Sorry, I put my hand back up because I, I did want to just also ask about if, well, it sounds like you are doing this and what kind of data you're going to look at to determine if it's working. And I, you know, I think you're going to look at what subgroups of students take various math courses eventually because that has been a stated goal but how are you going to evaluate the experience of um the other kids mm -hmm. um and 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 i i haven't seen it evaluated at jfk um, when advanced math left jfk i you know a lot of our kids lost the opportunity to take math at a level that many districts take in eighth grade and now they wait till ninth grade and so we gave that up and I don't know how we've evaluated that or if we have but what are you planning to use to evaluate the loss that's going to happen for um, kids that no longer have a class an honors level class so all kids will have an honors level level class if they choose to It'll just be embedded within a general level class yeah. so the data that we would look at would be how many more kids are achieving advanced level in their um, mcas math results how many kids um, are our psat on our sat scores go higher for all students um, based on the embedded math classes. And so those are just a few data points that we can use um, to look at how students are excelling across the board. So that's where we would look at that. And are you going to look to see if our highest achieving kids, say the, the ones that are currently taking honors, so maybe it's 25%, I don't know the percent, if they're not doing as well, is that going to be part of what you look at as well? I would look at all students to see um, how they are achieving in all of those areas and on all of those tests. Yes, um, I would continue to look at the high achieving students. I would imagine that they are still going to be high achieving, but yes. But so I'm just, I'm almost done, but I'm just gonna echo what member Busansky said. And that is, there's a lot of kids in our high school right now. I know a lot of the parents, I've talked to them. I've known a lot of the kids over the years who have been very, very bored at the pace of our math classes. And I just, I find it hard to imagine that as a, as a person who teaches material in college that relies on math, the bigger um, range of students in terms of their math abilities, the slower it goes because you don't wanna leave anyone behind. So I'm really concerned with where this is headed. Often we say, what, are, what is driving kids to 
charter schools, what is driving kids to private schools. And I think this is very close to the top of the list. Um, many families choose various charter schools because of this exact issue. So I think we need to be very careful about this and um, for so many reasons. If I could also point out that um, at the end of their 10th grade year and throughout their 11th and 12th grade year, if you can remember that dual enrollment opportunities will be available to them. So that's super exciting. They can go and take discrete math. They can participate in other higher level math through dual enrollment programming if they choose. So that option is available to all students as well, all of them. Member Gold. Um, for what it's worth, I, I want to put out there, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this deep analysis into the course without us talking and sharing like what we're hearing from parents, what we're not hearing from parents. I mean, we as school committee members know, like we only hear from certain subsets of parents and we complain about that all the time. I just would hope that if we had questions on this, we could just ask and say, hey, could we have a meeting with the math department and hear from them and move on from it. But um, invoking things um, like that's why parents are doing making choices, this and that are just too broad generalizations and unnecessary and unhelpful at this time. Um, let's see, uh, do you wish to continue? Principal Valancourt. I do, I have just two more things in the program of studies and then I hope we can put it to a vote and it passes. So the next section, there's no further changes in mathematics. And that brings us to the world language department. And in everything is pretty much staying the same in the world language department, except we are adding a new Latin class. And this class is called Latin and Greek for Professionals. I'm pretty excited about this course as it is available to all grades. Um, it is not necessarily for students who are on a Latin track. And it is um, really um, going to be pushed for students who are, um, who are engaged in work-based learning opportunities as this class will prepare them for understanding technical, um, technical language in Greek and Latin terms and how it connects to medicine and law and physics and biology. Really excited about this new class. So that's an addition to the world language section. And then finally on page 48, this is a very minor change, but it's pretty you will see that um, we have added the new IT Pathways logo to each of the classes that connect to the IT Pathway classes. So um, any course that has, um, that has a, a, an IT emblem next to it, that is a course that can be taken within this pathway. And so that's just like a new aesthetic, which I think is nice. And that concludes the new additions to the program of studies. And I will take any final questions if you have them. Member Voss. Sorry, I, I actually just wanted to respond to Member Gold because my comments were coming from the facts that at both private and local charter schools, you place into math classes and there are separate honors classes. And the facts that when we had our external review, many parents brought this up as an issue. And I have to date it, but about six or seven years ago, there were easily 80 parents at community forums talking about this. So it's not just about who you talk to, it's, it's these, in, these very public things that I'm referring to. Thanks. Okay, um, any other questions uh, for Principal Valancourt about the uh, program of studies? If not, I would entertain a motion uh, to Member Fallon. I was just gonna move to approve the program of studies. Okay, thank you. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Um, I didn't hear the May, oh, okay. Member Goldman seconded the motion. Um, okay, any further discussion? Member Seraphie Cox. 
Yeah, uh, Principal Valancourt, I just had a question about um, what sort of involvement there is um, either with the student union or with student groups in terms of um, getting input on the program of studies, that sort of thing. I went through the, some of the changes with them specifically in regards to early college and dual enrollment. And um, they are also heavily involved in and working to support access for all students. And they, um, and so they know about it and they gave feedback. We meet monthly and we talked about it then. I don't have a lot to report on that, but they are definitely involved in some of these areas. Great, just uh, wanting to continue to encourage that. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead now and ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Busanski. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Member Voss. I'm abstaining. Member Gold? Yes. And Mayor Narquist? Uh, yes. The vote is nine in favor, one abstention. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Valancourt, for that presentation. Um, so um, let's move on. Actually, let's just do a check in with the public. I had mentioned during the public comment period that we were starting at seven, but we knew that there were some parents who were um, probably at NHS um, open house. So I wanted to just open up this opportunity right now. If there's any parents who are still on the call who weren't able to be here at 645 uh, because of the open house and wanted to offer public comment, I would allow you to do that, do that at this point if you wanted to raise your hand. Um, maybe that you're tired from the open house and didn't come to the meeting. That's certainly a high probability, um, but I did want to make that available. So if any, any, any uh, members of the public who want to offer public comment can raise their hand either uh, with the Zoom function or, um, or on the phone. Okay, not hearing anybody or seeing anybody. So we'll, um, we'll continue on with the meeting. Um, next, we have the school committee's regular meeting schedule uh, vote. This is something I believe we, we moved off to, to do some checking on and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so this item has been on the agenda in the past. There were a few um, clerical errors that we wanted to clean up or they're pointed out last time this was on the agenda. And then the intention was to vote on this during the last month, um, but it wasn't included in the packet. So now we have it both on the agenda and in the packet and corrected. And so um, we've discussed it before. I think all of the issues have been resolved. And so I, I would hope we could um, move forward to approve this school meeting calendar. There are um, a couple of items that are to be determined that I'd like to speak to. Um, these are the what have been referred to as the quarterly meetings. The original name of them were the student success meetings. Um, and uh, they were in part designed around the Massachusetts comprehensive assessment system and accountability system, which of course we have no data for from last year due to the fact that the MCAS was canceled. For the upcoming year, I'm not sure what information we will have. Um, we do know that MCAS is taking place. In fact, MCAS started at the high school yesterday um, prior to the resumption of in-person learning at the high school. Um, but the full-fledged accountability system will not be there um, because, again, as I was just explaining, there are so many variables this year that are impacting student learning. It's not really um, 
fair or valid to try to draw too many inferences from the effectiveness of schools based on that one assessment. So um, some thoughts that I could share um, are that we may want to use one of those to review the results of the fall and winter screenings. Um, I began talking about those at the last meeting and said that we would um, have a more complete data set and I would enjoy the opportunity to just go through that with the, the committee to show what our local assessment shows about um, what gaps students may be experiencing and what growth they may be um, experiencing over the course of this year. And then another thought is we could dedicate one of those meetings to the SABERS, which is the social emotional component of that, um, which we have also done as part of our winter screening. So we can get a sense of what um, the social emotional needs are. We did, I did talk a little bit about that one, just to tease that one a little bit with the uh, budget and property subcommittee yesterday. And some of the results um, are surprising me in a good way. Um, as I, as I think about it, it makes sense, but it, it, it's surprising me that I think um, some of those results may be different than what we were expecting. So um, those are just some thoughts we could use to fill in those items. They are TBD, so we don't actually have to do that at this time to vote on the calendar, but I just wanted to share that while I was presenting them. We lose the mayor. Uh, Member Fallon, I guess you are in charge until we get our chair back. Well, can I just ask you, Dr. Provost, that week in January, the third week in January, when there's the 17th and the 21st, and it's a three day week, um, was that 21st? Uh, was that negotiated by contracts? Like, you know how parents, they get upset when when we don't kind of stack the days off together? Like, is there no way around that? Um, I think you're responding to the school calendar. Right now, we're talking about the school committee calendar. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was. So I'd be happy to talk about that when we get to the next item. Yeah, I was... <laughs> I'll take over if um, if Dr. Mayor Narkowitz, are you back? All right, I don't know who had their hand up, but I'll just call on Dina first and then Ronnie. I'm oh, sorry, Member Levy and Member Go. Thanks. Um, I just wanna uh, voice my, uh, I would be really in favor of spending some time looking at the screening data uh, I think it will be really, really useful to get a sense of where folks are. And I just want to echo my support for assessments and are using assessments that don't rely on, on the standardized testing that we know can be really problematic. So using the, the local screening is something I'm very much in favor of. Thank you. Member Go. You are out. Thanks, yep. Um, so I would encourage us really, I mean, I think we owe it as, as we learned um, in our very first meeting, uh, this in my two years when we, when we met in December and uh, with MASC representatives, our number one priority is student achievement and the um, state accountability system is the way we assess ourselves as compared to other schools in other districts. And I think we owe it to the public that they know that we all know that accountability system at the very beginning of a new tenure for a new school committee. Like just like we had to do like a breakdown initially in December of this is what your job is of the school committee. I really, I think it's critical that we see this is what the accountability system means. And this is what it's saying about your schools because beyond if, if we don't know that, then I don't understand how we're really supposed to do our number one job of care of student achievement. So I would highly encourage us to focus on the state accountability system. Um, that's and understanding that early on in the two years. Thank you. Anybody else? So we're back on the school calendar now, right, Dr. Provost? 
Sorry. We're on the school committee regular meeting schedule. Correct. So, and we need to vote on this, correct? Correct. Can I just ask you, um, there are so many different nuances and stuff. Um, is always a likelihood that something might occur. Have you had an opportunity to share this with others? Is this, have other people looked at this to see if there's any um, contradictions or any issues that might be going on with holidays or whatnot? We have uh, compared this to the uh, Massachusetts interfaith calendar to try to avoid any conflicts with religious holidays. But um, I do, I do ask everyone to take a good look at it just to make sure we didn't miss anything. And once this is set, it's hard, it's hard to change. So I would just ask, does, does anybody see any other issues here before we vote on it? Okay, can we take a vote then on this, Annie? Member Fallon has your hand up. I don't know if that's left over. It's left over, but I was gonna ask, did you compare it against the city council meeting schedule? You did, okay. Okay, we're all set then. Ms. Thompson, do you want to take a vote? I need a motion and a second. This is true. Move to approve the 2021 school committee regular meeting schedule calendar. Second. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? <clears throat> Sorry, yes. Member Goldman? Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. We don't have the mayor right now. And Member Dusansky? Yes. Vote is nine and one absent. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Dr. Provost, do we have the school committee calendar? You mean the school calendar? Yeah. Yes, that's in your packet. That's the next item. Okay, go ahead. Um, so in your packet, you'll find a uh, draft school calendar. The only reason it says draft at this point is because it's awaiting approval from the school committee. Um, as I will say every year, um, as one of the former school committee members used to say, the vote is really on the first day, the last day, and the total number of days in the year. So that's really what to take a look at because we have contractual obligations that, um, that impact when the first day can be. We have a state law that says when the last day needs to be done by, and then also state law that um, requires 180 days of instruction. So that's really what we're looking for the school committee to approve. I will note that this calendar represents um, a progression in our, our thinking as an alt team. Um, you'll notice that there are some more holidays that are included in the calendar this year. And I'll talk to you about the reason why. Um, we had a discussion. Um, well, we've had many discussions through the years about the calendars about which holidays should be included and which should not. Um, and the concern always of the committee was that, and, and I would say administrators as well, is that we didn't want to be in the position of trying to pick and choose which holidays were important and worthy and which ones weren't. And so there is an instrumental rule um, that districts default to which is what can you do with attendance? You know, do you have some days that are so important to your community that it wipes out your student attendance and wipes out your, your faculty attendance so that it doesn't really make sense to um, run school? We have a very diverse community and we don't have any days like that that are true, would truly trip, um, trip that trigger. However, we've been thinking a lot and and growing a lot, I would say, as a group in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And our thinking now is that it's important to have a calendar that represents what we've heard from our staff and what we've heard from our students about days that are important to them. 
And so we have heard, um, we've had heard from students and staff that having Jewish holidays on the calendar would be important. We've heard from our uh, Latinx community that having Three Kings Day would be important to have on the calendar. And um, we also would, if, if we're in a situation when the calendar extends to Juneteenth, we would put that on the calendar as well. It's not on the calendar this year because it happens to be on weekend, um, but that is a, a holiday that we would be thinking about bringing to the calendar in the future. So those are the, the changes for this year um, I'll, I'll, that we're recommending. I'll also say that um, again, there are some things that can change after calendar is approved. I think we changed the um, calendar five times this year without um, adjusting the first or the last day or the total number of days in the calendar. And one of the adjustments we've heard that NACE may want to enter into is changing the day of um, or the week of conferences. So traditionally, that's been the, the last week in October. By our collective bargaining agreement, it has to be the last week in October. Uh, but this year, it was moved to January based on the late start of the school year. And the feedback we've gotten from NACE is they think that January is a better time to do the um, do the parent conferences than October. And for many of the reasons that we've discussed before, um, you know, I've I've never been a fan of the October week. Um, of course, I've always provided for it because it's in the CBA, but it really comes at a time when you're just building instructional momentum. Teachers are getting into routines, kids are getting into routines, and then you have a whole week off the elementary. Um, and that's really what we're hearing from teachers now too, that it would be better to do that later rather than to have the um, that week up in front. So that may be, but we also had a uh, an understanding with NACE that we can't propose a calendar that violates the contract. So right now we have that week in October. I wouldn't be surprised if NACE um, came forward with a proposal to move those days to January. And that of course could be negotiated. Um, so that's the calendar we're recommending this year. And I'll be happy to answer any questions about it. Mayor Nark, are you back? I am back. Yes, sorry. There was some kind of an issue with my internet connection, and uh, I was um, I was out of the meeting for a moment. So apologize for that. Um, uh, Member Fallon, you have your hand up. Thanks. Um, yeah, Dr. Provost. I guess I just want to ask before we approve it. One of the biggest um, questions community members have made has that have raised is what are we doing in the fall as far as are we going back hybrid or all in um and as you know everyone lamented the fact that we didn't utilize the good weather and the low um virus numbers early on last year and i guess i'm wondering i mean do you think that we should be starting a little bit earlier um with with the expectation that we're going to lose some time later on in the, the winter again next year? Or, I mean, are you just planning to um, hope for the best and, and, you know, operate as if um, everyone's got gotten immunized? I guess, I, I don't know if that's factoring into your decisions at all. Well, the start date is controlled by the CBA. You can have five days of work prior to Labor Day. And so we have that here. Um, we're, we're starting right on August 30th, so we're working the full week before the Labor Day holiday. Okay, Member Fallon, are you all set there? Yeah, I suppose. So any changes as far as the opening of school would have to be negotiated and not through this process is what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Member Bisansky. Thank you. I, I guess what I'm noticing is that this is going to put us in a position to get out really late in the year, especially if we were to add on snow days. And I guess maybe all of that is a little bit up in the air. And I remember a few years ago when we changed to starting before August, it was to get us out earlier. And so I'm just wondering if there's any conversation about um, instead of having a February and April break, having one March, one week in March. And I know a lot of other school districts across the country are set up that way. And then that just saves you some days at the end, so. 
Um, we, we have not had that conversation. I know that there are a lot of um, districts in Massachusetts that have made the change to the, the March um, holiday and then have changed back. Um, I know in Connecticut, it works fine. In Massachusetts, it doesn't seem to work. I don't know why that is, um, but I, uh, that's why we haven't had that conversation. It certainly could be done. It's not against the contract, um, but I just am a little leery of it knowing that a bunch of other districts in Massachusetts have tried it and then felt like they missed the, fe the February break and the April break. So, and that's yep. something we could talk about more. Well, I'll just put it out there as an idea as we kind of try this calendar out next year. And, you know, if we do it, I mean, you know, at the rate at looking at the calendar, we could end up in school until the end of June. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll come to maybe it will open up some new conversations after that. So just a thought. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I just while I was gone was a motion made and seconded on this. Okay, so I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve the school calendar. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded, and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. And Member Fallon. Yes. The vote is 10 to zero. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, next item on the agenda. Um, this is a, um, this is actually a, a vote. This is a recommendation or a request from member Voss that we take up um, something in favor of vaccination of educators and, um, and uh, member Fallon uh, actually developed one. Um, and has brought it forward this evening. And so um, not sure whether, um, how we wanna do this. So uh, member Boss, do you wanna say anything or should I have member Fallon read the, pres the resolution that she created? Okay, um, so I'll ask um, member Fallon to present the um, resolution that she created. With the approval of Member Voss, though. In, in, <laughs> in collaboration with Member yes. Voss. <laughs> um, so it's a resolution requesting Governor Baker prioritize public school district personnel for vaccination. Whereas the Northampton School Committee recognizes that the city of Northampton, the state of Massachusetts, the United States, as well as the World Health Organization have declared a public health disaster and emergency regarding coronavirus or COVID-19 prioritizing disease surveillance and putting in place precautionary measures to stop its spread. And whereas public schools impact millions of students and staff having profound impact on families while charged with the care, education, nourishment of their students and are an integral part of the health and safety of our communities. And whereas our district has responded to the challenges brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic while conducting the day-to-day -day operations of our schools and ensuring the efficient delivery of instruction virtually and in person. And whereas the Northampton School Committee has a substantial public interest in protecting the health and safety of its students, staff, and community to ensure that the district is fully prepared to most effectively face the challenges resulting from the COVID-19 health emergency. And whereas the Baker Polito administration has developed a vac vaccine distribution plan prioritizing the availability of vaccines to healthcare workers, first responders, and vulnerable populations. And whereas the governor and education officials have said that they wanna prioritize in-person learning, even when there is a high transmission rate of the virus. And whereas district staff at all levels are essential to the day-to-day -day operations of this district and critical for virtual and in-class instruction. 
and whereas the Northampton School Committee requests that Governor Baker next prioritize school district employees for purposes of vaccine allocation. It is therefore resolved that the Northampton School Committee finds a substantial public purpose exists to request that the governor designate all public school employees as essential frontline workers, and further, as such, they be given priority in the statewide administration of the COVID-19 vaccine effective immediately. Okay. Um, are you moving that uh, resolution? Yes, I would move to um, accept the resolution as presented. And is, I'll second it. Okay, Member Voss seconds. There's a question from Member uh, Sarah P. Cox. Thank you. Um, one question, uh, two questions. One question is, um, if uh, the, the governor were to implement this, um, what difference would you imagine that it might have in terms of when uh, school employees would receive uh, vaccinations? And then the second question is, um, since we authored this ourselves, uh, what sort of coordination um, should we be doing with other districts in order to amplify our voice? So there have been there there have been a group of coalitions. So for example, the superintendents roundtable they wrote a letter um, as a group. There is a group group of uh, gateway districts that got together and wrote a, le um, a letter together. Um, the Hadley School Committee wrote a letter. So it's been a lot of um, it hasn't been a concerted effort per se. Um, it's and so that was why when um, Member Voss asked, you know, should we write one? I didn't really have a template for a resolution um, because people had mostly just been writing letters and it had been sort of according to which group they were happened to be working with at the moment. Um, so that's, I guess the first question is I'm not sure how to amplify it um, in that most, most of the, groups I've spoken to have either already written with another group or um, or don't see the point, to be honest, because the governor's made it very clear that this is what he's doing and he's not really inclined to change. Um, and then part two, uh, I don't remember what the other question you asked was. Um, well, I uh, maybe I should ask it a little bit more clearly. Um, do we have a, an expected timeline of you know, what the governor's timeline is, and then if the governor were to magically implement uh, our suggestion, what, how much sooner would that move up um, school employees? You know what, honestly, I don't think anyone expected for companions to be able to magically move to the front of the line to be able to suddenly get shots. And so I feel like this is just us saying, look, you know, you've made it clear that, at, you know, in-person education is a priority, then you need to make it a priority to, to vaccinate our in-person educators. Um, and so I think that's really what we're trying to, to do. Um, and so I guess I have no expectation. I don't know exactly um, what the availability is. Um, I do know that people are struggling to even get appointments who are still in the 75 and up, I do know our legislators. Le legislators are working really hard on the, um, the mayor would know more about this, but on the perceived availability in the Western part of the state versus the Eastern part of the state. Um, and so, yeah, so I just thought it was important for us to advocate on behalf of the employees in our district. Don't get me wrong, I'm in full support of it. I just <laughs> want it just, just wanting, uh, you know, that information out there for the public. So Member Gold has his hand up, but Member Voss, did you want to speak to this question as a, I, as a, okay. I do, thank you. And thank you, Member Fallon, because I think you just said, um, I agree with everything you said, and I really appreciate the work she put into constructing the resolution and we talked about it, but she did the vast majority of the work. Um, to answer, to further answer your question, Member Sarah Cox, I think Part of it is also there aren't a lot of resolutions out there. And so, you know, by putting one out there, it makes a strong statement and it enables other groups to say, yeah, we're going to, you know, do something similar. And, um, you know, I, I really disagree with the governor saying open up your schools, but your teachers are way down on this list. So I think sending the strongest message possible that we need to get our teachers vaccinated 
as soon as possible um, is, is what we should be doing. Um, I, maybe I can ask uh, Dr. Provost to just speak to the, to the factual question of what is Desi saying about timing for vaccinations for school employees? Thank you all. I'm going to be, um, I don't want to seem cagey about this, but I have heard so many different dates and they've all come and gone that I, I really don't want to um, create expectations. I can tell you it was a topic of um, the discussion on the, the um, commissioner's call this afternoon. Um, and I can tell you that there was the, for me, very disappointing um, report that um, VA was going to be involved. I, I had shared with the group before that the VA was going to be possibly the distribution site, and that would be really good for Northampton educators, obviously. Um, and part of the rationale for it was that um, the VA has done a great job with the logistics and has, of all the organizations has really demonstrated its competence in getting large numbers of people vaccinated in a efficient way. However, I do believe probably some state federal conflicts came into place because the announcement this afternoon was that educators who are eligible for VA benefits can now be vaccinated at the VA. So that's a very tiny number of educators. Um, the, the, the quote that we kind of left with was just re-quoting Dr. Fauci saying that we are probably going to be a wash in vaccine by the end of March. So I think my reading of that is that we're looking at another six weeks probably, but I could easily see that time frame come and go like the other ones have. So I, I, I just offer it with a, a grain of salt. And all I can add from the city's perspective, just as, since we're running a regional vaccination clinic for all of Hampshire County is we're, we're trying to, you know, we're limited on how many vaccines we're given and we're limited that we can only vaccinate depending on what phase we're in at the current time. And so we're, we're trying to get the 75 plus part of this and get as many of those folks. And now obviously there's caretakers or people that accompany them. And so no one can really give us a time frame on when they think we'll then move to the next phase, which is the 65 with two comorbidities, and then early edu and then educators have been moved up, you know, to the next category in phase two. So it's you know, the president said today that the, that they've secured you know million hundreds of millions of new um, vaccine doses, but when those will actually come to Massachusetts, we don't know. So we're sort of still, um, you know, stuck there. Um, Member Gold. Uh, yeah, I was just curious if um, we got any feedback from NACE on this or, or if NACE, I, sometimes like, do we ever do like co-signing a, a resolution along with the with NACE or, or with the teachers union if it's something that they support to put more weight through it? So anyway, just curious if it's, to get feedback from them. I don't know if we can ask Andrew. Dr. Either. Provost. I, in my opinion, I don't think it would be appropriate to have NACE co-sign a school committee resolution because this really is the voice of the school committee. However, on the letter that um, was referenced that all the superintendents of our um, round table and also the Franklin round table wrote, many of those were jointly signed by the superintendent and union president and ours Northampton's signature included both me and Andrea. So um, I think we have accomplished a similar thing. Um, I think everyone understands that all players in this um, in this arena are aligned on this issue. Um, and I, I'm sure I'm sure the NACE members who are present right now appreciate that the school committee is is considering a resolution that matches so closely the letter that they co-signed with with the superintendents. Cheers. Okay, so are there any more questions about this uh, resolution? Okay, um, then I will ask the clerk to call the roll.
Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narquit. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Sarah Feacock. Yes. The vote is 10 0. Okay. Again, thank you to um, Member Fallon and Member Voss for bringing this forward. Um, and finally, we have uh, uh, the last piece of new business um, um, actually is a required report from our liaison to the Collaborative for Educational Services, Member Fallon. Um, not sure if this maybe in, is, may have been better in reports, but it's a report and it's from the Collaborative for Educational Service and I'll turn it over to Member Fallon. Thank you. Um, so last month, the um, was the first month um, since um, the retirement. Um, oh gosh, I'm losing my mind of Bill Deal. Um, and so we now have an interim executive director, Karen Ruder. She was the former program director. Um, we um, have 89 as of the last I heard 89 applications for the executive director position. Um, and we've begun the pre-screening process um, to see if we can um, narrow that down a little before we begin the screening process. Um, hopefully the position will be filled by June. Um, I am going to forward you tomorrow the executive director's report, but in the meantime, I wanted to just focus on, we had a presentation um, by Emily Hoffman from the Massachusetts Migrant Education Program that was absolutely fascinating, um, like truly riveting. And I just wanted to share some of the highlights with you. Um, the uh, Massachusetts um, Migrant Education Program is a, is a federally funded grant program. Um, it's funded through the Title I Part C of the Every Student Succeed, Succeeds Act. And the collaborative is now overseeing the program um, as a sub-grantee for DESE. Um, and they've asked essentially for school districts help in identifying um, students and families who are eligible for the grants. Um, funding and to work with them and collaborating for who would be eligible for the services. And so the purpose of the migrant education program is to help migratory students and youth um, meet high academic challenges by overcoming obstacles that are caused by their lifestyle. So uh, including um, educational disruption, social iso isolation, um, cultural and language um, prob uh, differences, um, extreme poverty, health-related issues, um, and any other factors that would interfere with their ability to do well. Um, the, who can participate in the program? Um, the program serves all identified eligible migratory students who are residing for at least one day, that's it, for one day in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and they are between the ages of three and 21. Uh, years old, and it provides opportunities for parent involvement and support as well. And so the eligibility for the program is just based on two factors. Is there a migratory child and youth? Um, and is there a migratory fisher or agricultural worker? So when you're trying to identify whether or not a student um, is considered a migratory child or youth, they need to be between the ages of three and 21 years old. Um, they need to have moved into the school district in the last 36 months. Um, and the question you need to answer is, do they live with or are they a migratory agricultural worker? Um, or um, or, is, or do they live with a, migra a, a migratory fisherman uh, who contributes to the household? So it doesn't need to be a parent. It doesn't need to even be a relative. It can be anyone in the household who's serving as a migratory uh, worker. So if the answer to any to all those questions are yes, they're considered a migratory um, child or youth and they're eligible for services. Um, and so um, 
the questions you would ask as far as the, are they considered a migratory agricultural worker, a migratory fisherist? Did they move to the residence uh, in the past 36 months as a, as a result of economic necessity? Um, and did they engage in qualifying work in the last 60-ish, she said ish, they've been very um, lenient with the guidelines um, because of the pandemic of the move um, and or have they even looked for work in the field um, or have a history of um, migratory work. And so if you have both the migratory child, the migratory worker and they qualify for services, um, they have essentially, there's an app that you can use that's super simple. It's available in French, Portuguese, Spanish, English, um, where you can contact um, the, the, the program. It's located in Springfield for our region um, and they will connect um, the family or student with services. Um, in our region, the majority of, um, of the hiring for um, the qualifying workers is typically agricultural. Um, it's defined as the production or initial processing of crops, dairy products, poultry or livestock, um, as well as the cultivation of trees. Some of the employers in our area um, include like Norse Farms and De Silva Fruit, uh, Soslowski Potato Farm, Pioneer Gardens. Um, and so really they're just, um, now that we've got this fund, uh, this funding available and they're administering the grant, they just want everyone to be aware of it. Um, it's like doctor's offices, students, uh, teachers, school committee members, anyone um, to be aware of it. Anyone is allowed to use their um, referral service to try and connect students and families with help. Um, they have support services that are both direct and indirect. They can assist in school enrollment. They have um, after school tutoring. They've got MCAS tutoring. They've got summer programs. They've got family literacy programs that are like one on one and home based. They've got out of school youth programming and um, uh, college and career exploration. They have parent advisory councils and parent workshops. So they're really looking to collaborate with school districts, community agencies, and family and youth um, to serve all of the students who would qualify for this grant um, as well as possible. So it was all really interesting. I wish that you had been there, but I will mail you um, the, the rest of the executive director's report and then you can always ask um, if you have any questions at all. And you won't hear from me again for another two months about it, I promise. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Member Fallon, for that report and for your continued service on, on the collaborative. Um, so that I believe brings us to our final item on the um, agenda. Uh, we have um, no discussion topics scheduled this evening. I will announce future business and meeting dates, uh, the budget and property, well, that one already took place, um, February 10th, uh, school committee budget uh, meeting, Thursday, February 25th. So this is our second meeting of the month that we hold beginning in February uh, for the first few budget. Uh, then we have school committee meetings on uh, Thursday, March 11th, 2021, the rules and policy subcommittee on March 18th, 2021, school committee meeting again on March 25th, 2021, um, our first 2021 school committee retreat, Thursday, April 29th, 2021, and our second school committee retreat, Thursday, June 17th, 2021. Um, I would now entertain a motion to enter into executive session as our final item on the agenda and would request someone make that motion. Motion, motion. to enter executive session. Second. Okay. And I'll just consider that motion as read on the, as listed on the agenda. Um, and there's a second on that. So I will ask the clerk to call the roll on the motion to move into an executive session. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. 
Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. And Member Serafi Cox. Yes. The vote is 10 to zero. Okay, so the school committee will now move into executive session um, and uh, in accordance with Massachusetts general law, um, because to hold this uh, session in open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's uh, negotiating position. I will also let the public know that we will not return uh, to open session. Uh, we will actually adjourn from the executive session. Um, so, um, so with that, I will now ask 